Welcome to How to Ace Your Next Job Interview, an employment presentation created and narrated by David Richardson. Have you heard? Employers really like to hear about your success stories. In fact, success stories are your number one strategy for acing that upcoming job interview. I can almost hear you saying, wait a minute, that sounds too much like magic wands and unicorns to me. Storybooks are for kids, they're not for adults trying to find jobs. Though I'm not going to talk about unicorns and magic wands, I will be talking about some magic, marketing magic, the kind of magic that will set you apart positively from other applicants who are also seeking the job that you want. For as long as you appear to be no different from anyone else applying for that job, how can you expect the employer to take a deeper look at what you have to offer? So we need to give employers a reason to give you that deeper look. If we don't, your resume will simply remain just another sheet of paper on the pile, and that's not an effective way of getting hired. So how do employers judge you? That's the crucial issue, and let's be honest, that is exactly what they are doing. But again, how? Well, employers are pretty much like you. You have an image of what doctors, teachers, bankers, and other professionals look like and act like. And you expect these professionals to match your image of them before you would be comfortable doing business with them. So too, employers have in their heads an image or model of what the effective employee will look like and act like. And they'll judge applicants for jobs on the basis of how well each matches that image just as you would judge doctors and lawyers on how closely they match your expectations. So the closer you match the employer's expectations, that is, the employer's image of the effective employee who will match the open position, both in skill and in personality, then the more likely it is that the employer will hire you. But again, how do you match this image? How do you even know what that image is? Well, here's a hint. To know what the employer's image is, first identify the job title and become familiar with the job description. The duties described here will tell you what kinds of problems the employer wants you to solve. Just imagine yourself solving these problems successfully and you'll have a close approximation of the image in the interviewer's mind. And that should give you a clue about how to answer the questions the employer is going to ask you. For you see, all the interview questions that you hear, no matter what they actually sound like, are seeking answers to just three essential questions. And these three questions are designed to discover how well you match the interviewer's image. The closer you match that image, the better suited you are for the job. And that's how you get the job offer, by meeting the employer's expectations. Now, what are these three questions? They are easy to state, and here they are. 1. Can you do the job? That is, do you have the right set of skills? 2. Do you want to do the job? That is, do you have the motivation? 3. Will you fit in with the company? That is, do you have the right work ethic and worker traits to fit in with other company employees and follow supervisory directions without a problem? Now the employer won't ask these questions directly. He already knows what you would say. He doesn't need to interview you to find out, and neither do I. Can you do the job? You'll say yes. Do you want to do the job? Again, you'll say yes. Will you fit in with the company? That's another yes. But this won't help separate you from any other candidates, because they all would say the same thing. Unless they are completely nuts, of course. But the employer will assume that you're not until you give evidence to the contrary, like the applicant here. 
I have no skill. I have no motivation. I have no interest in being on your team. So rather than ask the three questions directly, the employer will ask a series of other questions, each open-ended and designed to get you to open up and talk freely. Questions such as, are you a good team player and why do you think so? Or why should I hire you for this position? The employer will use your answers to these open-ended questions to answer the three questions that the employer is really interested in answering because these three questions enable the employer to make a prediction about your suitability for the job and your ability to perform it. But we still haven't given an adequate answer to the question, how do employers judge you? To do that, we're going to have to consult a legal dictionary to introduce a term with which you might be unfamiliar. But don't panic, it's news that you can use. I want to help you develop an accurate model of the employer's process, one that explains how hiring decisions are actually made. The legal term I'll define for you will do precisely that. This won't take long, so be patient for the next four slides. Now I know that a job interview isn't a court trial with a judge and jury, and employers don't permit a legal professional to represent you and advocate your case. But though the two are different in a number of ways, they both result in important decisions based upon evidence, decisions that can affect your future and your finances. And that's close enough for our purposes. So let's take a look at a civil court case term. That term is called preponderance of evidence. It's a heavy legal term that even sounds heavy, but we'll cut it down to size and you'll find it useful. This concept of preponderance of evidence is based on the notion that some evidence can be more convincing or weighty than other evidence and more likely to be true or accurate as a consequence. It's not about the amount of evidence presented but about how solid and persuasive that evidence is. For example, one clearly knowledgeable witness may provide a preponderance of evidence over a dozen witnesses with hazy and inconsistent testimony, or a formally signed agreement with definite terms may outweigh opinions or speculations about what the parties intended. Preponderance of evidence is required in a civil case and is contrasted with beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the more severe test for evidence required to convict in a criminal trial. But no matter what legal resources used for the definition, the idea of preponderance of evidence is always somewhat subjective, just like the job interview itself. But legally, this is how the concept is supposed to work. Each side in a civil case submits evidence. The judge has power to prevent some evidence from being submitted because it does not conform to the rules of evidence. For example, here is a testimony, that is testimony not from a direct witness, but by another party who simply claims to know what an actual witness saw, would not be allowed, because according to the rules of evidence, such testimony is simply not legal evidence. No court would allow it, criminal or civil, so each side must submit evidence that is acceptable to the court. At the conclusion of the trial, one side's evidence will seem to have more weight than the other in the view of the jury or simply the judge if there is no jury. The verdict of the court will be in favor of this so to speak heavier side because the attorney for that side presented a preponderance of the evidence. In other words, the attorney presented the greater weight of evidence to support that side's position. How does any of this relate to the employer and job interviews? Very simply, the employer who interviews you must use the very same principle, even if he or she has never heard the term or knows what it means. Surprisingly, that really doesn't matter. Job interviewers will be forced to use something like the preponderance of evidence rule because, just as in a civil court case, they are looking for the candidate who offers the greatest weight of evidence evidence that confirms that candidate as the best choice for the job. There is simply no other way to do it. But there are some differences. Here is how the principle works in a job interview. Just like a civil court case, the applicants are going to be measured according to the weight of evidence. 
But unlike a civil case, there will be more than two sides of the scale. In fact, the number of measuring plates will equal the total number of applicants, six in this case, to accommodate all six applicants, and all plates begin at an equal balance. Then during each job interview, an applicant presents evidence to support the claim that he or she is the best suited to do the job the employer is hiring for. The employer serves as both the judge and jury to hear and evaluate this evidence, though a modern trend is to have a team of interviewers hear and evaluate the interviews for the employer. In addition, the employer is also the one asking the questions, which puts all applicants on the witness stand, so to speak, to testify in their own defense. So you see, the court analogy is not at all far-fetched. At the end of the interview, one applicant will seem to stand out from all the others as the best candidate for the job. That candidate has given the weighted evidence that outweighs the evidence submitted by other candidates. And that is the candidate that the employer is going to hire. So you see, the method of determination the employer uses to make the hiring decision is very much like the preponderance of evidence rule used in civil law cases. And knowing this raises the essential question that you must ask and answer before you go to the job interview. And that question is, how do I give evidence in the job interview, the kind of evidence that the employer will find persuasive? And here's the answer. Tell success stories that demonstrate your job skills and your good worker traits, such as teamwork and commitment to quality service. Picture, for example, to the employer how you've solved problems on the job, how you've used your skills effectively to improve production, how you've met and exceeded customer needs and expectations, how you've contributed to your team to meet special challenges. Why success stories? Because success stories don't simply tell the employer about your skills and qualifications, your problem-solving talent, your ability to improve production, your successful teamwork or customer service experience. Instead, they show those skills in action, on the job, through a series of pictures, what I call mind movies, these mind movies present you as the effective employee in action, and that's what the employer is looking for. Perhaps something like this, in response to a hospital dietary supervisor's question to an applicant during an interview for a position as assistant kitchen supervisor. Listen to the supervisor's interview question. Our kitchen serves hundreds of patients, visitors, and staff each day and we also cater special events occasionally, so things can get quite busy. We need experienced people who can work together to get the job done. Our patients depend on that. So tell me, why should I hire you for this position as opposed to anyone else I interview this week? Now, let's listen to the applicant's answer. I am skilled in this kind of work. I have the proven experience you need to handle this job. But let me give you an example of what I mean. In May of 99, I worked as a dietary cook for Wellbrook Hospital. The hospital frequently plays host to special events, or special training sessions. When this happens, the kitchen generally, caters the meals. About the middle of May, the kitchen catered to special events, on the same day. This created a problem. Each evening, the kitchen must be closed by 7. But because of the two events we catered that day, the dishes were really backed up. I was done with my cooking duties, but I saw the problem that our dishwashing staff was having. So I volunteered to assist with the dishes to get caught up. As a result, we were able to wash all the dishes and still close at the required time. My supervisor, Jenna Rucker, told me, good job Louise. Thank you for helping. It meant a lot to the staff. Later, I was awarded a certificate for most valuable player of the team. I was also trusted with more responsibility. My supervisor asked me to take over the duties of receiving and ordering work. 
in addition to my duties as dietary cook. I was proud to serve my co-workers and supervisor in this way. Teamwork and the willingness to take on responsibility are strengths I carry with me in any work I do. This is why I think you should hire me for this position. Along with the employer, do you see the mind movie that this applicant is projecting? One of an efficient employee who fulfills her job obligations but then goes that extra mile to assist co-workers to maintain quality standards and get the job done under unusually stressful conditions without being asked. Her story shows how she is recognized by her supervisor, receives a team award and is entrusted with greater responsibility. But all of this she presents in a way that requires the employer to mentally develop a series of moving pictures that give visual representation of the candidate, one that invites a highly favorable view of her work skills and interpersonal abilities as well as her work ethic. In short, a representation that very likely will match the employer's own image of the effective employee in action. Did I just hear an objection? I need to project pictures using stories? I don't know if I can pull that off. I read stories, I don't write them, so how do I start? I mean, I do my job, but that's not exciting story material. It's pretty boring stuff, actually. So how do I develop the success stories you're talking about from my own experience? I don't really have that much to talk about. It's really not that hard, and you will have plenty to talk about. You'll see, but let me give you a place to start. Think about a time that someone on the job thanked you for something. That person could be a supervisor, or co-worker, or customer. Doesn't matter. Just answer this question. What did that person thank you for? The answer to that question always points to a job-related problem that you help to solve. And that's your starting point. For example, suppose you worked as a security guard for a major Indianapolis private security firm. Acme Security. It was mid-June and your employer needed to fill a security guard slot overnight because the assigned security guard was not available. The client's industrial facility is just south of Bloomington. The company has a security vehicle available but getting to the client's site will require a bit of driving and it's an overnight assignment. Your supervisor, Mr. William Hastings, asked for a volunteer to cover the position. Though it would require you to work a double shift, you volunteered to cover the open slot. Mr. Hastings, recognizing the inconvenience, thanked you for taking the assignment on such short notice. What was the problem? The employer didn't have anyone available to handle a special and inconvenient assignment. When you volunteered to do it, problem solved. Get the idea? Whatever you are thanked for doing will always point to the problem. Just answer the question, what did the coworker, supervisor, or customer thank you for doing? The answer to that question is a job-related solution, and that solution points to the problem you're looking for, the problem you help to solve, which is the basis for your success story. How do we turn this incident into a success story? With a tool. What else? See, here is the outline we will use to pull all the information together into a success story. Step 1. State the date, your job title, and the name of the company. Step 2. Briefly describe the problem. Step 3. State the action steps you took to solve the problem. Step 4. State the result, that is, the problem is solved. Step 5. State any other positive outcomes. Did someone thank you or praise you? Sometimes you might have gotten official recognition, a bonus or a promotion, so mention these. But usually, someone simply thanked you, a customer, a co-worker, or a supervisor. Step 6. State that you are proud of your service and include a positive quality or two that the story shows about you. And that's how we do it. Just follow the outline. But let's see an example. Now let's follow the six simple steps in this outline, one step at a time, to create a success story, using the Acme Security incident we've already talked about. Step one is date, job title, and company. 
Now this won't be hard. The job title was Security Guard and the company was Acme Security. Moreover, we have the exact month. The incident took place in mid-June 2011. Of course, sometimes our memories get a bit hazy about times and we can't think of the exact month. When that happens, just give the season, winter, spring, summer or fall, and the year. That should be close enough. But for this incident, we have the precise month, along with the job title and company. Now with these three items of information, we have the introduction to our story, something like this. In June of 2011, I worked as a security officer for Acme Security. Step 2, the problem. Start here by picking a time reference. If you know the month, pick one of the first three, A, beginning, B, middle, or C, end. If you don't know the month and you have used the season, then pick the last selection, D, on one occasion. That should cover any time and would sound like this. On one occasion, we had a problem. In this story, however, we know the event happened in the middle of June, so we introduce the problem with the phrase, about the middle of the month, we had a problem. And now we can add the problem details, answering questions such as 1. How did I find out about the problem? 2. Simply stated what was the problem? 3. Why did the problem have to be solved? And 4. Did the problem present any complicating conditions? To the first question, the supervisor was the source of information about the problem. And here is a note. If the supervisor figures in the story in any way, try to think of the name, preferably the last name, and use it. In this case, it is Bill Hastings. Question 2. The problem simply stated is that a security guard shift was not covered. Question 3. The problem had to be solved because the company had to meet a security contract for its client. And 4. The client was in Bloomington, not nearby, and the assignment was for overnight. And that's the problem in a nutshell. Putting these notes together, we come up with the following statement of the problem. About the middle of the month, we had a problem. My supervisor, Bill Hastings, told me that a Bloomington client's facility needed coverage overnight. The scheduled guard was not available. The company had to assign another guard to meet the contract. Mr. Hastings asked me if I could drive to Bloomington and cover. Step 3, Action. Now you simply note the action steps in sequence that you took to resolve the problem. In other words, write what you did to solve the problem or improve the situation. Simple notes will be sufficient here. Just write them down in chronological order. What you did first, second, third, and so forth. In this case, 1. Checked out vehicle and drove to Bloomington facility. 2. Pulled second shift to provide overnight security. 3. Observed no incidents to record. And 4. Filed report and checked back into the Indianapolis office with the vehicle. Step 3, Action. Now if you speak these action steps in sequence, simply expanding a bit on your notes, you will succeed in describing how you resolve the problem. In this case, it would sound something like this. Using a company vehicle, I drove to Bloomington to the client's facility. I pulled a second shift to provide security overnight. There were no incidents to report. In the morning, I filed my shift report, drove back to Indianapolis, returned the vehicle, and then checked back into the office. Now, the next step should be apparent. And that's step four. And this step requires simply the report that the problem was solved. The problem you defined in step two. Don't make this step complicated. Just report that the problem was solved. In this case, we noted that the supervisor told you the problem and asked you to solve it by covering the shift. So you responded to the supervisor's request. You covered the shift, met ACME's contract obligation, and observed no security incidents to report through the night. That's it. Just use brief notes to identify each part of the solution, separated by number. Now use a phrase such as, as a result or because of this, and then state each item in the solution, something like this. As a result, I took a problem off my supervisor's hands, 
covered security for our client's facility overnight, helped ACME security to fulfill its contract obligations, and observed no security incidents to report. Again, don't make this complicated, just state that the problem or problems you identified in Step 2 were solved. Step 5 now deals with positive things that happened to you after you helped to solve the business related problem. Typically, this is just someone saying thanks to you, a supervisor, a co-worker, a customer, or perhaps a combination of these. So report what was said to you. In this case, the supervisor was grateful and said thanks, you're a lifesaver. In addition, the supervisor assigned additional hours and overtime. This is significant recognition and is important to the story. Of course, sometimes we are recognized more formally. We get a promotion or an award, such as Employee of the Month. Mention any more formal recognition, but these are more rare than someone saying thanks to you. Yet the appreciation of a supervisor, co-worker, or customer is sufficient recognition to give your story a proper conclusion. They give testimony that you, as an employee, provide value in the production of a product or delivery of a service, and that is what the employer wants to know about you. Now using your notes, you can say something like this. Mr. Hastings was pleased with my performance. He thanked me for standing in at short notice to pull a second ship. He also told me that I was a lifesaver. After this, he began to give me additional hours and overtime. Step 6 is an opportunity to connect your success in solving job-related problems with your work ethic. In other words, you take personal satisfaction and pride in your successful and efficient job performance. How do you say this? Well, on the job, who can you serve? Well, here's an exhaustive list. The company, a supervisor, a co-worker, a customer, or a patient in a medical story for the patient is the customer in a clinic, hospital, or rehabilitation center. Just pick two of these that make the most sense to you from your story. In this case, supervisor and company were selected, and this is what we can say. I was proud to serve my company and supervisor in this way. Now add a couple of positive worker traits that describe you in the story. Many could be identified such as professionalism, customer service, dedication, teamwork, or ability to endure long hours. But in this case, flexibility and problem solving were picked and using these two positive worker traits we now have a conclusion to the story. One that emphasizes good worker traits and connects them to the mind movie images we have projected into the mind of the interviewer. This allows us to make a strong statement about our positive work ethic and the strengths we bring to the job, backed up by the concrete proof we have given in the story. It would sound something like this. I was proud to serve my company and supervisor in this way. Flexibility and problem solving are skills I depend upon in any work I do. Now let's put all of this together, step by step. You will hear the success story and see it in the text projected on the right. The outline is on the left. The section of the outline that is being executed as you see and hear the story will appear highlighted in red. So follow along. Now let's suppose the employer asks you, I'm going to interview several people for this position. Tell me, why do you think I should hire you instead of another candidate? It's a tough question, but you begin your reply. I have the skills you are looking for, and I'm experienced a problem solver and flexible when things get tough. But let me give you an example. In June of 2011, I worked as a security guard for Acme Security. About mid-month, we had a problem. My supervisor, Bill Hastings, told me that a Bloomington client's facility needed coverage overnight. The scheduled guard was not available. The company had to assign another guard to meet the contract. Mr. Hastings asked me if I could drive to Bloomington and cover. Using a company vehicle, I drove to Bloomington to the client's facility. I pulled a second shift to provide security overnight. There were no incidents. 
In the morning, I filed my shift report, drove back to Indianapolis, returned the vehicle, and then checked back into the office. As a result, I took a problem off my supervisor's hands, covered security for our client's facility overnight, helped Acme Security to fulfill its contract, and observed no security incidents to report. Mr. Hastings was pleased with my performance. He thanked me for standing in at short notice to pull a second shift. He also told me that I was a lifesaver. After this, he began to give me additional hours and overtime. I was proud to serve my company and supervisor in this way. Flexibility and problem solving are skills I depend upon in any work I do, and that's why I think you should hire me for this position. And there you have it, a complete success story. It's short and to the point, and the pictures are powerful evidence in your favor to place into the employer's mind. Since the employer is using the preponderance of evidence rule anyway, these pictures make you look more weighty than other applicants competing for the job. You appear to have substance, a good work ethic, demonstrable work and interpersonal skills, and a history of job success that you can talk about persuasively. In short, the story projects in pictures an image of you that matches the employer's expectations, and that's what you want to do. In fact, doing this over and over again during the job interview is the secret of holding the employer's interest offering evidence that you are the right person for the job and finally getting that job offer you're looking for. It's a powerful tool. So use this success story tool to prepare for your next interview. Use these six simple points to prepare at least four or five job success stories and you will be well equipped to answer the toughest questions that employers will ask. And you will sound professional, competent and in control as you answer. The employer will notice and so will you. So get busy. There is a job out there that a success story from you will claim. What are you waiting for? Put your story together and go claim your job.